Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is 10 to Life where we talk everything, everything, everything true crime. So if you're brand new and stopping by for the first time and you've never heard of this channel, that's okay. And I hope that you appreciate today's case coverage. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel by hitting that subscribe button, which is totally F-R-E-E free, just a free way to support. And for all of my returning 10 to lifers, welcome back. I am so happy to have you guys here with me today. You are going to be with me for a while today because we are going back to a case that we've been talking about for months on this channel, but there are so many new updates and so we have got a lot to talk about. So put on your comfy socks, your fuzzy socks, grab your coffee if it's the morning for you, grab a cocktail if it's the evening for you, and get ready because we are going to jump right in. Tend to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. It's been a few months since we have talked about the disappearance of 19-year-old Dylan Rounds. Over the last couple of months, it's been difficult to decipher between the facts, the conspiracy theories, and the drama surrounding this case. There have been hundreds of videos bringing into question the people in Dylan's life, who he spent time with, the credibility of his family, and even things such as his relationships and financial situation. With so much hearsay, half-truths, lies, drama between the true crime community and Dylan's family, it has been really hard to figure out what's true and what's not. And the facts of this case started to get lost, and the entire story has become really hard to follow. It seems like after some channels covered this case from the beginning, many of them had to take a pause, myself included, because it almost became impossible to figure out where to even start when trying to provide an update or summarize the circus that it was becoming. Fortunately, recent interviews with Dylan's parents, Candace and Justin, have now provided some much-needed clarification and have redirected conversations back to the facts of this case. The family has criticized the way that their son's case was handled by authorities since the very beginning. And Candace and Justin have admitted that law enforcement actually recommended that they try to conceal some of the evidence in this case as to protect the investigation. After waiting months for police to do the right thing, it's become clear that that isn't going to happen. And Dylan's parents are now going to have to once again take matters into their own hands if they want to find their son. Candace and Justin have decided that now is the time to be fully transparent with the public about all of the evidence in the case, because keeping the facts to themselves has done nothing to push the case forward. While it was their intention to preserve the integrity of the case by keeping some evidence close to the vest, so to speak, it seems that by doing this, it caused the public to speculate and to fill in the blanks for a lot of things. So much so that people started losing interest due to the lack of factual information. So with Candace and Justin finally deciding to go against law enforcement and release the evidence that they have in this case, we can now finally start to piece together what more than likely happened the day Dylan went missing. Hopefully the new spark in public interest due to the transparency and clarity of the case will put pressure on law enforcement to do what needs to be done to find and get justice for Dylan Rounds. And if you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about and you have never heard Dylan Rounds' name before, you're not familiar with the case, that's okay. You're not alone. What I'm going to do is link the playlist to this case in the description so that you can check out the earlier videos there and get fully caught up. And since it's been so long since we discussed the case, before I delve into the new information, I'm just going to try to refresh everybody's memory on what we knew when this whole situation first started. It's been five months since Dylan Rounds went missing from his farm in Lucen, an extremely remote ghost town located in Utah close to the Nevada border. At only 19 years old, Dylan had purchased land in Utah with the help of his grandfather to start his own farm. Even though the land in Lucen is desert and what most would consider unfarmable land, getting acreage there was inexpensive, and Dylan was determined to have a successful crop there. Dylan was obsessed with farming all of his life, even as a little boy. When his parents got divorced around age five, the separation was hard for him, but he found something that he was extremely passionate about, which helped him keep his mind on something positive. Dylan spent time living at his dad's, his mom's, and his paternal grandparents' houses growing up and was involved in clubs like FFA before he decided to then quit school to focus on farming full-time. 
He did part-time work on various farms to earn money until he was able to buy his own land, and he had to spend several years getting the soil ready and other preparations before he could plant his first crop in late summer of 2022. Dylan had various people helping him on his farm as well, including a friend of his grandfather's named Don Hadley, also a man who lived in a trailer close by named Jim Brenner, and a man from the town of Montello named Kurt Wadsworth. Now, Montello is a town over the Nevada border, where the very few people who lived in Lucen would drive to for a drink or for a burger at one of the two restaurants close by, either the Saddle Sore or the Cowboy Bar and Grill. To give an example of how far away everything else in Utah is from Lucen, the Box Elder County Police Department that presides over Lucen is actually a two-hour drive away. The drive from where Dylan's farm was to Montello in Nevada was only around a 30-minute drive, so it was really out in the middle of nowhere. In the summer of 2022, Don Hadley and Dylan apparently had a falling out due to an argument over some work that needed to be done at the farm, and they decided not to work on the farm together anymore. However, even though they didn't work together anymore, they still did communicate here and there. After Dylan's land was ready for planting, he really didn't need much help planting seeds, so when it came time to do that, he was mostly working alone. On Dylan's farmland, he had an RV that he would keep his stuff in and maybe sleep in it on occasion. But if it wasn't time to work on the farm, then Dylan wasn't staying in Lucen and would either be at his grandparents, one of his parents' house, or with a friend. At the end of May, Dylan had his 10-wheeler grain truck full of seed, and it was ready to plant. Now, since it rarely rains in Lucen, he only had a tarp covering the seed, which was sufficient unless there was going to be a heavy downpour and a risk for his seeds getting wet. Because if the seeds got wet, they could prematurely sprout and mold, which would ruin them and just be, you know, a huge loss to Dylan. So about five miles away from Dylan's RV and farm, his acreage backed up to a parcel of land that was owned by somebody else. The landowner didn't live out there, but did have a large metal shed that he told Dylan he could use if he ever needed to put his grain truck inside. Jim Brenner had an RV on this man's land and was asked by the landowner to kind of keep watch, keep watch of the shed and of the property. There was also a barbed wire fence around the parcel of land that had the grain shed, but Dylan was at one time or another given a key to the lock on the fence in case he ever needed to put his grain truck inside. However, since Dylan hadn't been staying in Lucen very often at all, Jim Brenner decided to get the lock and fence gate changed and hadn't given Dylan a new key. On Friday, May 27th, Kurt Wadsworth and his daughter Taylina both say that they saw Dylan in Montello early in the day, and then it's been reported that he went and worked on his farm all night. Early the next morning, Saturday, May 28th, at around 6.51 a.m., Dylan told his grandmother that he had to get his truck, put it in the shed, and that it was supposed to rain heavily that day, and that he was going to have to call her back because he had to get his truck in the shed. He didn't want the seeds to spoil, so, you know, I'm going to call you back, Grandma. Dylan was always in communication with either his parents or with his grandparents as well, and it was pretty standard for him to call his grandmother to let her know what was going on and what he was going to be doing on the farm and just everything about his day. However, on Sunday, when Dylan still hadn't called her back after getting off the phone with her when he was taking the truck into the grain shed, his grandmother called family friend Don Hadley and asked him to go check on Dylan since he wasn't answering her phone calls. This would have worried her since Lucen again, is so remote and Dylan worked with heavy machinery, had been driving potentially in the rain, and she just wanted to make sure that everything was okay. Don told Dylan's grandmother that he and Jim Brenner actually went to Dylan's farm, but that they didn't see him anywhere. They told her not to worry and that he had probably just gone to Montello. But the next day, when they still had not seen Dylan, they notified his grandmother and she became a little bit more worried. That's when she reached out to Dylan's best friend, JD, who then called Dylan's mother to let her know that nobody had seen or heard from him. Dylan's mom, Candace, and dad, Justin, got together and made the drive to Lucen to see if they could find their son. On the way there, Candace called and filed a missing persons report for Dylan with the Box Elder Sheriff's Office. When Justin and Candace arrived, they saw that the seed truck had been parked in the shed, like we all thought and like Dylan had said to his grandmother he was doing, and that Dylan's other truck was parked five miles away at his farm where his RV was located. Candace noticed that there were deep ruts from the tires going into the shed, which led her to believe that the truck would have to have been put in there after it rained because dry dirt wouldn't have left ruts like that. Also, Dylan's other truck appeared to have been pressure washed, but there was mud in the wheel wells, indicating that the truck 
truck must have been driven in or after it had rained on Saturday night and early Sunday morning. So Dylan's family started looking through all of his things to see if they could find his phone, his wallet, or anything else that could give them a clue as to where Dylan might have gone. They weren't able to open Dylan's truck door because they couldn't locate his key fob. And if the key fob was in the RV somewhere, the truck was parked close enough to the RV that the door would have opened. So this made it obvious that the key fob was nowhere in the RV. So Candace and Justin asked the police if it would be okay for them to break the back window, to which they answered, yes, you can do whatever you need to do. When they got inside the truck after breaking the window, they noticed that the seat had actually been pulled forward, which would either mean that somebody short, like his mother Candace's size, was driving the truck, or that it was pushed up to find something behind the seat or clean behind the seat. Also, the truck was put in four-wheel drive, which was broken on Dylan's truck. So whoever drove his truck last must not have known that the four-wheel drive didn't work. They didn't find anything of importance in the truck, but did notice that Dylan's pistol that he normally kept in there was gone. The family was in and out of Dylan's RV several times looking for various things. It was pretty messy in there, which is not unusual for an RV of a 19-year-old who just, you know, crashes there randomly when he's not working on the farm. So although it was messy, it wasn't super concerning. When Dylan's extended family arrived, one of his aunts decided to clean out the bathroom in the RV to make it nicer for the grandmother to use and to get all the clutter out of the way. To clean around the sink area, she had to move an empty gun case, which would normally have a pistol inside, and took all of the trash away so that the bathroom and the sink was usable. About 90 minutes into searching around Dylan's land, a pair of boots were found behind a dirt mound around 100 yards away from the shed where his seed truck was parked. Candace and Justin knew that those boots belonged to Dylan because he had worn the same type for pretty much his entire life. Seeing the boots made Dylan's parents way more worried than they were before because they knew that their son would not go anywhere with no shoes on, and he wouldn't have just thrown his boots back behind there like that when they weren't even old or worn out at all. They were also pretty clean and didn't have any mud on them, which led them to believe that the boots must have come off early Saturday before the rain or else they would be muddy from the wet, sludgy dirt and so on. On the boots, there was a noticeable spot that looked like it could have been a droplet of blood or possibly some oil. The police put the boots in the back of one of their cruisers and told the parents that they were going to take them into evidence and test them for DNA. Everyone who knew Dylan tried to rack their brains to see if there was anything that they could remember that might help them figure out where he might be, where he could have gone, and what may have happened. Candace remembered that a week prior to his disappearance, Dylan called her and told her that he had a strange run-in in the desert with a man named Chase. She said that Dylan had told her that Chase was bloody, had no shoes on, and wanted to use Dylan's phone. Dylan said he let Chase use his phone, but didn't give him a ride. Eyewitnesses in Montello told Candace that Dylan actually did give Chase a ride, though, and so she figured that he must have just lied about it because he knew that she would be angry at him for giving a ride to a sketchy guy in the desert in his truck and, you know, putting himself in potential danger. Even though Dylan loved to tell a good story, he apparently left out parts that he knew would worry his parents. So Candace and Justin thought that maybe, since Chase was in the desert with no shoes, and Dylan was now without his shoes, that it could be somehow somewhat connected, and they posted a $5,000 reward for any information leading to Chase's whereabouts. Less than an hour later, Kurt Wadsworth called and told Candace that Dylan was being held hostage by Chase at his friend Robert's house. Well, when police arrived and searched the home, they realized that it was a false alarm and that Kurt admitted that he had gotten that information from a psychic. I mean, guys, it is just getting beyond crazy. Candace and Justin believed that when Kurt saw the reward for Chase, he figured if Chase did end up being involved in Dylan's disappearance somehow, then he would be able to get that $5,000. During this time, Chase was actually trying to get in contact with the police department to clear his name and prove that he had an alibi and was nowhere near Lucen during the time when Dylan went missing. And he even had to contact Candace and Justin because he wasn't able to get anyone on the phone or a call back from the police department, even though he was a person of interest in this case. After he was able to prove his whereabouts on Saturday and Sunday, Chase seemed like much less of a suspect. So the search continued, and with each passing day, Candace and Justin felt like the Box Elder Police Department was becoming less helpful and less interested in solving their son's case. They understood that it was a pain in the butt to drive the two hours out to Lucen, 
But regardless of the distance, it was still their jurisdiction and their duty to find Dylan. It started to become evident that with the police being so far away, Lucin and Montello were pretty much just left to fend for themselves and be their own police. Box Elder didn't really take finding Dylan's boots as big of a deal or as a sign of foul play either like Candace and Justin did, and a week later, it was discovered that the boots were still in the back of that cop car and hadn't been put into evidence and hadn't been tested for DNA. So feeling like she had absolutely no other choice, Candace turned to social media to spread the word about Dylan's disappearance and the lack of help from Box Elder Police Department. So as you can imagine, the true crime community became very interested in the bizarre details surrounding the case, and soon, the large YouTube channel Heavy D Sparks stepped up to help search for Dylan using his personal helicopter and drones. From above, some tire tracks were found in a wash, which is sort of like a ditch in the desert where water once flowed, and if you stand on the edge of this particular wash, or if the dirt above it is disturbed, hundreds of pounds of dirt slough off the edges and fall down into the wash. If something fell into the wash or was placed near the walls of the wash, it could quickly be covered up by dirt because of how easily it just sloughs off the side. You can drive along the bottom of a wash if it's shallow enough to get a vehicle down into, and Candace took many detailed photos of the tire tracks, hoping that Box Elder, who took Dylan's truck into custody after it had already been gone through and touched by several people, would see if the tracks matched the tires on his truck. Over the next couple of months, Candace and Justin organized their own searches for Dylan, since there was little to no assistance from the Box Elder Police Department. Candace also did several interviews with local news stations and on a few true crime YouTube channels, which led to the true crime community trying to piece together this entire case and doing extensive research into all of the people potentially involved and analyzing every word that came from Candace and Justin. There were several interviews where Candace or one of the family members made contradictory statements regarding the evidence that they had, which unfortunately caused the public to lose some trust in the family. The true crime community and their viewers started wondering why Candace's story seemed to keep changing, and it made them feel like she was being deceitful or dishonest on purpose. And the true crime channels discovered that members of Kurt Wadsworth's family had pretty significant criminal backgrounds, and it was speculated at first that he may have done something to Dylan, possibly due to money that Dylan recently had come into, or because Dylan maybe owed him money. Then the backgrounds of Chase Venstra and Robert came out, and there were rumors that people saw both of them driving around Lucen during the time that Dylan may have gone missing. Not much had come out about any legal troubles that Don Hadley may have had in the past, but the same could not be said for Jim Brenner. Jim had actually been charged with attempted murder about 30 years ago, and apparently has a pretty violent temper and bad drinking problem as well. Just recently, he assaulted another man with a chair, and there was a felony warrant out for his arrest. So with all of these men, with the exception of Don, having past felony convictions for one thing or another, over the course of the next few months, each of them were arrested on firearm charges because all were allegedly in possession of guns, which is against the law for a felon. Many people believed that the police arrested these men on the gun charges mostly to make sure that they all stayed put, and so that tabs could be kept on them during the investigation into Dylan's disappearance. With only certain information released, some people knowing more than others and some people just making things up, different rumors, theories, and conspiracies started circling around YouTube and Facebook. When questioned, Jim Brenner said that he had actually been home all day on Saturday and Sunday until he left his house and stopped by a nearby pond and then made his way to Don's house for a barbecue. He said that he didn't see anyone at all that weekend and hadn't seen Dylan for months, let alone putting the truck into the shed. And that was all any of the channels were really able to discuss, until recently, when Candace and Justin decided to release all the information they knew and clear up a lot of misconceptions and theories floating around on the internet. So now that we're kind of up to date with the very watered down version of everything that has taken place over the last five months, I want to go over all of the different inconsistencies that were in Candace's timeline and story that caused many people to lose trust in the family. I remember Candace saying several times that everything needed to be so fact-based, but it was really hard for people besides those in her inner circle to do that because they were keeping so many of the facts to themselves. 
Now we know that Box Elder, who started getting assistance from the FBI, actually is the one who told them to keep certain pieces of information to themselves to protect the case. While most people can understand that, there were also several times where one person would slip up and say something different than the time before. And there were even times where they completely changed part of the story, and that caused people to become very confused about what was true and what wasn't. The first thing that was inconsistent was the location of Dylan's key fob. There was an extra key fob that Dylan's grandparents brought from their house at a later time so that his truck could be driven but the one that Dylan had in his possession was missing at first. I mentioned before that the whole house was searched and if it had been in the RV, the truck was parked close enough that the truck door would have opened. So that's how they knew that the key fob was not at the RV. In one interview, Dylan's stepfather said that the key fob had been found, which let people know that at one time it was lost and now it was found, but they didn't say how it was found. And then in another interview, Candace says that people were getting confused and the key fob was not found that they were mistaking it for the one that Dylan's grandparents brought from their home. That same sort of scenario happened with Dylan's pistol. I explained how before they had looked in Dylan's truck for his pistol and how it wasn't there, and the gun case was also empty on his bathroom sink, which his aunt had thoroughly cleaned and gone through. However, in an interview, it was said that Dylan's gun was found. So many people believed that Dylan's pistol was found, but then Candace said in another interview that people were confusing his pistol with another type of gun that was found at another house where he stayed, and that the pistol still was missing. So here's the gun thing, and, and this is this is where this needs to be found. The gun that was found was Dylan's shotgun. Okay? Dylan's shotgun. Dylan's shotgun was found. We were looking for it until, I think it was Wednesday, when... Wednesday or Thursday that Dylan's little brother went back and the shotgun was on Dylan's bed at the great grandpa's place. So that's the gun that was found was his shotgun. That has been twisted and miscued in so many different ways, but that's what it was. And that is the same with the key fob that people are being told was found. Larry and Karen brought another key fob. They brought it on Thursday It might have been Wednesday. It was Wednesday or Thursday. But then we put it back in the pickup. That was before we moved. We had to have a way to get the pickup home. You got to get the key fob. So they brought the key fob. That's also the key fob that was home. So once again, it's the fact, fact, fact that we have to stay on. And I don't even know how many interviews I have done at this point. But I'm going to fact that has changed. It is factual, and that's the only way we're going to find Dylan is if people stay factual and and listen, listen to Dylan's story, and let's find them. Let's not go off and chase wild geese, and I mean, it's just, it's crazy. So if you got lost and were confused, don't worry. That was the main problem here. There were so many different versions about the gun and the key fob that no one knew what to believe, or if it was even significant in the first place, to be quite honest. But since Candace has now decided to release all of the information we learned that the key fob and the pistol were missing, but that someone brought both items back to the RV at one time and secretly returned them. Did you all find the gun and the key fob? It was my son and Dylan's friend. Yeah. That walked in the trailer and said, oh, it's here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even think that they knew it was missing. No, they didn't even know we were looking for it. They Because they weren't there when we were Mm-mm. when we broke the window and were looking. But you're sure it wasn't there the first time? You oh, absolutely it. not. Uh-uh. From what I heard, the law enforcement had taken pictures. Yeah. And oh. it wasn't in the pictures. Yeah, it absolutely was not there. Neither one of them. And, and so when um, Dylan's grandparents brought the extra key fob, I set it in the exact same location. Walk to his pickup, hit the button, and it would unlock. Mm. It was close enough, it would still unlock it. That key fob and that gun were not there. They came back, and there was really only two people out there with access to put those back underneath our noses, and that was Brenner and then Don. The only two people who had access to Dylan's RV, besides his close family, would have been Jim, Don, and possibly Kurt. One piece of information that I'm not sure was purposely kept quiet, or if maybe I just missed it, was that Jim Brenner actually had a horse, which is why he had a fence around the property where he was staying. I think a lot of people assumed he put up that haphazard fence just to be a jerk and make it difficult for anybody to drive through, but it actually was intended to keep his horse from running away, which apparently his horse had gone rogue and done that in the past. So he made this fence to try to, you know, keep it contained. 
The next piece of information that was kept from the public was that there was another call made after Dylan had talked to his grandmother that morning, early on Saturday, before he put the truck in the shed. And the last ping wasn't just an app in the background like we were originally told. There were, in fact, several other pings that are very significant. We were told that Dylan's grandmother was the last person that Dylan spoke to, but his cell phone records show that Dylan actually placed a call to Jim Brenner afterwards, and his phone pinged near the gate when the call was made. Candace and Justin believe that Dylan placed the call to ask Jim to come open the gate so that he could park his grain truck in the shed. After that, it's not known whether Dylan was with his phone, but over the next several hours, there were pings around Brenner's RV, the shed, back at Dylan's RV, again at Brenner's, and then one last time at that Lucen Pond. So June 16th, Dylan's phone was discovered in the Lucen Pond by a search and rescue crew member, where Jim admitted to going before he went to Don's barbecue, if you remember his alibi. There were also horse tracks found by the pond as well, which was thoroughly searched and the phone ended up being the only thing found there. In addition to putting himself at the pond where Dylan's phone was found, Jim admitted to finding Dylan's boots near the shed. He said he moved them up to his RV for Dylan to come and get later, but then he figured that Dylan wasn't going to come back and get them, so he moved them behind that dirt pile. Which, hi, that makes absolutely no sense. You are a horrible liar. Even though the dirt pile also was once used as a burn pile for trash, it hadn't been used for that in a really long time. And it's not like the pile was very close to the shed where Jim could have just been casually chucking the boots over there. It wasn't making sense. He would have had to walk them over there, and it's pretty suspicious that he just assumed Dylan wouldn't be back to get the boots. So as you can see, the majority of the evidence that has been found, all by Dylan's parents, by the way, points to Jim Brenner being responsible for whatever happened to Dylan. Candace did say that there was DNA of some sort found in the shed as well, but she wasn't able to be specific about what kind it was. Even though there were several inconsistencies in Candace and Justin's original interviews, it makes sense now why they felt they needed to do that for the police to be able to build a case against Jim Brenner and really anybody else who may have helped him. Even though it really did muddy the waters for several months and caused some people in the true crime community especially to cast doubt on the family and question what was real and what wasn't, I think it's evident now that Candace was never trying to purposely deceive the public. She was just doing what she was told and thought that it was necessary to preserve her son's case. But as we can see, the Box Elder Police Department dropped the ball so many times throughout this case, and it's no wonder Dylan's family has absolutely no trust in them whatsoever, and why they feel like they have no choice but to take matters into their own hands. Jim Brenner was initially questioned when he was first in custody, but then he got a lawyer and officers were no longer able to interrogate him about anything that he may know about Dylan. However, within the last couple of weeks, his lawyer, who is a public defender, had to drop his case due to a conflict of interest, which some believe that maybe she was also assigned to represent either Chase or Robert. So Jim currently doesn't have a lawyer, but according to Candace, he still has not been interrogated further by police, if you can even believe that. Candace believes that if he were questioned enough that he would probably crack and at least tell some information that could lead to where Dylan is. But so far, they aren't even trying to do that, which is crazy because he's already told on himself a bit. He said he was at the pond. They found the phone there. He said he touched the boots. The boots were suspicious. He's already put himself within there. So you would think that by interrogating him further, even if he didn't, you know, outright confess, he probably would say certain things that they could piece together and have enough to figure out where Dylan may be, where his remains may be, or what may have happened. Now, you might think that Box Elder couldn't possibly screw this case up any more than they already have at this point, but unfortunately, that is, would prove to be untrue. In addition to not taking Dylan's parents seriously at the beginning, treating it like a normal missing persons case instead of a criminal investigation, they only recently stated publicly that they were going to treat the case like a homicide investigation but have yet to formally change the status of the case, which would provide them with many more resources if they did. Even though the FBI is able to assist Box Elder, they aren't able to take over completely because it's not a federal case. And against Candace and Justin's wishes, Box Elder has stated that they will not release the case to another department, 
regardless of their volatile relationship they've caused with the family. And this is just crazy to me. And I could be wrong, but in my opinion, I, re- I think the reason that they're not allowing anybody else to take over the case is because they know they ultimately effed up here. They dropped the ball. They probably screwed up evidence. They've you know, let people go. It's just beyond the worst. And I truthfully, I just think they don't want to be held accountable to that. And Box Elder made a statement. They stated, we learned from Candace and Justin about how Box Elder didn't take the case seriously from the beginning and were barely ever present when the family organized searches in the desert for Dylan. We also learned about how they let the boots sit in the back of a police cruiser for over a week before turning them into evidence to be tested for DNA. They also allowed whoever to just go in and out of Dylan's RV, his shed, and vehicles, which should have been taken into evidence immediately to preserve any possible DNA. And they still have not charged or questioned Jim Brenner further about information he may know. Candace said that when they found the tire tracks in the wash, they requested for the tracks to be compared to Dylan's truck tires, which apparently was never done. The family had to find their own experts to analyze the tire tracks, and they did conclude that it was almost certain to be a match. That means that someone had driven Dylan's truck into the wash after it had rained, which would mean that it was after he had gone missing. The parents requested that bloodhounds be brought out to run the wash in case Dylan had been dumped there. Like I said earlier, hundreds of pounds of sand could easily slough off the sides of the wash, which would make it really easy to cover a body. Several people have also stated that they heard Jim Brenner say in the past, if you want to hide a body, take them to the wash. However, Box Elder has still not brought out any bloodhounds to run the wash. But in addition to all of that, Candace released yet another screw-up on Box Elder's part that is just so infuriating and just so senseless, it's almost hard to understand what they were thinking. On June 2nd, Jim could be seen cleaning things out of the shed, and police sat there and watched him do it. At that point, they were still not considering this case a criminal investigation, so according to them, they couldn't tell him to stop. Jim took four large trash bags filled with items out of the shed, which wasn't just trash because the shed still to this day is covered in Jim's garbage. So he was taking out specific things, and even if he was able to legally, you know, clean the shed, at this time there was already a felony warrant out for his arrest due to him assaulting that man with the chair, and police could and should have arrested him on that warrant to keep him from getting rid of any evidence, but they didn't. They literally just sat and watched him take evidence out of the shed, load it into a truck, and then drive away with it, all while they could have arrested him. So no one is sure where the trash bags were taken, but Candace did say that the next day he went to Wendover, which is about an hour away from Lucen, and could have possibly dropped them off anywhere in between. Candace believes that if the police would have made the shed a crime scene, then all of the evidence would still be in there, and that they would probably have been able to figure out what happened to Dylan, or at least been able to charge Jim with concrete evidence. YouTuber Heavy D Sparks, who has been assisting Candace and Justin since the beginning, offered to work with Box Elder to use a special drone of his that has technology that can redirect light and find any disturbances in the earth. Apparently, it has capabilities to find unmarked graves and any other disturbances in dirt and has such advanced technology that it actually was banned, apparently, for some time. However, the drone can be used privately, but Box Elder told Candace and Justin that they didn't think the use of drones would be helpful in finding Dylan. So once again, with the help of Heavy D, Candace and Justin are going to use that drone technology without the involvement of Box Elder, and hopefully they'll be able to find something that can lead to Dylan. So at this point, it's almost like you have to ask yourself, are the Box Elder Police Department, are they stonewalling everything because they don't want to be held accountable and they know that they've royally screwed up up until now, so they don't want to pass the case to another agency because they don't want to be held accountable for that? Or does it run deeper? And are they trying to cover up for somebody? Is there somebody in the office who's involved? Which, again, I'm not trying to go off on a conspiracy here, but you're getting somebody, you're getting all these leads, you're getting all these tips, you have a known felon, you have, you know, everything is basically being handed to you on a silver platter, and you're choosing to do nothing about it. Why? And then you even have somebody saying, hey, look, we found all this, you know, even though we're not on great terms, you want to use my drone? Like, here's what it can do. Here's the technology it has. 
No, no, I don't think that would be very helpful. I don't think that would be very helpful. Like, what are you talking about? At least with the Kylie Rodney case, when Adventures with Purpose came and offered their services, they utilized them. Because why wouldn't you utilize every resource possible to find a missing boy? Give me a break right now. So that's where everything is currently with this case. And without giving too many specifics, Candace and Justin have said that before winter, there's going to be a big push in the search for Dylan. They have several private organizations that are going to aid in this search. And they're really going to focus on that wash where they believe Jim probably brought Dylan's body. My biggest thing that that I need people to know right now, and, and we will be coming out with some information on it um, in the near future, is... We do have a plan. We are not done and we, we've got a big plan. Um, that's, that's the main reason we want all of these different people to stop is because we've got professional help coming and we need, we need a big push before winter because once that weather changes out there, you know, the conditions, you're not going to get people out there. Um, so just, just know, I know it feels like, you know, we release all this information and, when, and then it's like, ugh, that's it. Like, you know, there's everybody's always waiting for that next push and we are working on that next push. But there's a lot of organization. There's a lot of, uh, you know, it needs everything needs to be collected or cool, calm, collected, controlled, no chaos and and go through every area we have in question. And those plans are in place. And I have been working on that since last week. So you have more than you have uh, more than one search group coming to help private search groups right yeah, yeah we yep we've got some stuff in place from some people that have um reached out from the bit some of them from the beginning um wanting to do this and i thought well you know we don't want to get law enforcement's way we don't want to you know step on any toes nah screw that we're done with it um we're gonna make a big push and we're gonna we're gonna cover some ground so as of now, that's all the updates we have. I personally am really glad that Candace and Justin decided to come forward with all of the information that they felt like they had to withhold previously and let the world know how horribly their son's case has been handled. I think that Jim Brenner tossed the boots behind the dirt pile and then he or either someone maybe helping him returned the key fob and the pistol so that he wouldn't get caught with any of Dylan's stuff. I think Jim probably thought that Candace and Justin wouldn't go this far to find their son and maybe thought that they would have given up by now, but they have made it very clear that that is not going to happen. I hope that by Dylan's parents putting a spotlight on how cases in rural areas are handled sometimes, that just as much resources and effort gets put into cases that are put into high profile cases or cases that are heavily populated in communities and cities. Jim Brunner has actually contacted Justin Rounds and attempted to hint at Chase being the one responsible for Dylan's disappearance but he clearly doesn't realize just how much evidence actually there is stacked against him. While I do think that Jim probably did get help from someone like Don or Kurt to either dispose of Dylan or return the items to his RV, I believe he is the one solely responsible for whatever happened to Dylan. What I think likely happened is that Dylan got up to the gate and called Jim to come open it, and maybe he didn't answer, so Dylan broke the lock, or maybe he marched up to his RV and banged on the door because he needed to get his truck into that shed to protect the seeds. And then Jim, being an alcoholic, was probably hungover or not happy about being woken up so early, or got angry for Dylan getting into the gate somehow, and there was some sort of altercation. Jim clearly has violent tendencies, so maybe he struck Dylan, or maybe he shot him thinking he was an intruder while he was wasted, then drove the grain truck back to his RV to see if there was anything he could steal or maybe anything that he could use to dispose of the body. If he didn't drive the grain truck, he must have gotten a ride from somebody else, because it's extremely unlikely that Jim would have walked the five miles back to Dylan's RV. Then he may have walked or ridden his horse to the pond, ditched Dylan's cell phone in the pond, and then went to Don's barbecue, as though nothing happened. Or maybe Don was helping him, and then they decided to, you know, throw a barbecue after the fact to cement an alibi of some sort. After the barbecue on Sunday, after Don told Jim that Dylan's grandmother called looking for him, he possibly put Dylan in the truck, drove him out to the wash, and disposed of him there, making sure that he was covered with dirt. Then pressure washed Dylan's truck, and then went and parked it in front of Dylan's RV, taking that key fob with him. Now that's just one scenario, but I think it's safe to assume something along those lines happened. Hopefully if Box Elders decides to finally question their suspect, 
they can get answers out of Jim. And with the help of the infrared drone, hopefully they can find Dylan so that he can be brought home and properly put to rest. Candace said nobody should have to fight this hard to get help from law enforcement to find their child. And I think we can all agree with that. Heavy D has decided to match Justin and Candace's $100,000 reward, making it $200,000 for anyone with information that can lead to Dylan. So I will definitely keep you updated on this case with any new leads or developments, and hopefully the increase in reward encourages whoever may have information to come forward. And hopefully, Box Elder Police Department can get their head out of their ass long enough to actually do the right thing here and make some moves. Arrest some people, at least question them at the very least, and quit being so shady. Or if you just feel like, you know what, you guys are way too incompetent to handle it, you don't like the two-hour drive, fine, pass it over to the feds. I don't like you, Box Elder. I think you're doing something shady or you're just being lazy. This is a missing 19-year-old boy. His family deserves closure. His family deserves answers. And you, my friends, are the one thing getting in the way of that. So time to shape up or ship out. You guys are whack in my opinion. Just my opinion. All right, guys. Sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent there at the end. Anyways, thanks for tuning in with me today. Please continue to keep Dylan's family in your thoughts and prayers. Hopefully, they'll get answers soon. Hopefully, the right people will be held accountable. And hopefully, this case will, you know, get passed to people who are at least competent enough and willing to do the right thing and, you know, investigate. Imagine that. Investigators actually investigating. Who would have thought? Such a big, tall order to ask, right? Now that I think about it, I really should have worn my red flag shirt for this today. Maybe I'll put it in the thumbnail because there are just so many red flags in this case. So I'm going to wear the 10 to life red flag shirt next time I cover this. But if you have yours, put it on because there are just countless red flags here. Anyways, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. And until the next one, stay safe.